So um, welcome everyone uh, to, this is the fifth Fireside Chat hosted by the Turing Way. Um, I'm Emma Caroon, I'm a Senior Community Manager at the Turing Institute and a member of the core cool team in the Turing Way. Um, this time we are delighted to partner with Lily Winfrey from the Frictionless Data and Yanina Alini Savine, hopefully I've said that right, I did practice, um, from Meta Desencia, who have co-designed this session um, with the Turing Way team. Lily will be introducing herself as a co-moderator along with our community manager, Anne Lee Steele. And we also have representation from Meta Desencia in today's panel that you will learn shortly. Um, a few words about the Turing Way. Um, it is an open source, open collaboration and community developed resource on data science. Our goal is to make reproducible, ethical and collaborative data science accessible and comprehensible for everyone. We represent an international community of researchers who create resources as chapters and community practices, bringing perspectives from, our, um, from, country, from their own countries and backgrounds. This fireside chat is an effort um, towards creating a space where people can gather and exchange concerns, explore challenges and share different practices that work in different contexts. Please note that we um, have a shared etherpad to facilitate um, written note taking and um, invite ideas from you um, who have joined to listen. So please do um, take a second to write your questions and thoughts in there. Um, we have a code of conduct that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration. For any concerns, reporting of an incident that makes you feel uncomfortable at this call or further ideas to improve accessibility, please email the turingway at gmail.com. Um, you can also um, reach Malvika and Anne directly by emailing their private email, and that information is also in the etherpad. So with that instruction, I'm really delighted to hand over to Anne to kick off today's session by introducing herself, the topic, and our speakers. Thank you very much, Anne. Thanks so much, Emma, and it was such a lovely, it was also lovely to hear the birds uh, as you began the introduction. Uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Anne-Lee Steele. I'm the new community manager for the Turing Way, and I'm really excited to engage with the speakers and you all today on this really important topic. Um, so why enabling inclusive research conferencing during what many people are beginning to call the post-pandemic era? It goes without saying, as the rising number of cases worldwide has shown, this pandemic is far from over. And as we all know, COVID-19 has brought about a reckoning with how academic research is done across borders and how academic conferencing is done in turn. And for more than two years now, the majority of events have gone online, if not adapted a hybrid format due to the mandates to work from home and the health risks of gathering collectively. And this has led to many shifts. On one hand, the ability to participate in events from home has enabled people, especially those for whom events like conferences have been prohibitively expensive or geographically far away to participate for the first time. But in a time of social distancing, we've also seen a rise in social isolation and worries about its impact on collaborative working practices and widespread burnout with online platforms. Hybrid conferencing has emerged as a possible solution to this, but as we've seen or perhaps experienced, it also involves different trade-offs and brings about different problems in turn. And we wanted to create a space today. I uh, thank you, Yanine uh, Bellini Sadene, for suggesting this topic to gather people from kind of across the spectrum of conference organizing to talk about the trade offs involved in these formats the in person, the online, and the hybrid to talk more about how they can be done as inclusively as possible in the months and years to come. And one thing is clear, though, that the new normal can't be a return back to how conferencing was done before COVID 19. And our speakers today have a really wide range of experiences in all three of these formats, and we're excited to gather them to, to talk more about um, their different experiences, and I'll, I'll leave it to them to tell you more about themselves. And so we'll, we'll begin with a short round of introductions of about two minutes each to kick us off, um, talking more about your experiences with conferences and how the pandemic has changed your work. Uh, Lily and Elia will introduce themselves and the Frictionless and Metadescentia projects first, and then we'll have Ben, Dorothea, and Gilbert, respectively. A small reminder to those tuning in, don't forget to use the Zoom chat or the Etherpad to write notes or to ask questions, and we'll take note of them for our speakers here. And speakers, if you'd like to respond to each other's questions or comments throughout our conversation today, we ask you to maybe use the raise hand feature on the bottom right hand side of your screen on the reactions panel. 
But really, that's enough for me. Uh, on to you, Lily. Thanks so much, Anne. Uh, hello, all. My name is Lily Winfrey, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you all about this discussion. I'm the product manager of the Frictionless Data Project at the Open Knowledge Foundation. And while I've long been an admirer of the Turing Way, I've never actually been to one of these fireside chat before, chats before. So I'm really excited to experience this with you all. Uh, and I wanna thank Anne and Emma and all of the panelists and organizers for their help today. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Frictionless Data mainly because I wanna invite you all to an upcoming workshop that we have. Frictionless Data is an open source project that aims to make data more usable. And we've been working with researchers to help them make their data more open and reproducible, all with the goal of making research more open. We have a suite of open source tools, both coding and non-coding friendly, that focus on metadata, data standards, data visualization, and reproducible data cleaning pipelines. And we have a free virtual workshop coming up in about a month on the 25th of May. And that will introduce newcomers to our toolkit and teach people how to work with metadata and data validation. So if you're interested in that, please keep an eye on our Twitter account for the details. And I'll put the Twitter account in the chat here. Um, so for the discussion today, I'm going to be wearing my hat as a co-organizer of CSV Comp, which is a conference that's focused on data users and data storytellers. And CSV Comp will be going in person this year for the first time in three years. So that's the position that I will be uh, talking about on the panel today. But I won't get into that yet. I will wait. And um, I think I'll hand it over to Ilio. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Elio Computelli. And yeah, like Lily, I also wear uh, many hats. So I'm a PhD student in atmospheric sciences, and so a teacher, and a maintainer of R packages. And in those roles, I, I'm, I'm very big fans of the Turing Way Handbook for Reproducibility Research. I also, we, we also we even used uh, a, a big part of that for to create a, a workshop for reproducible research using R. So really, thank you a lot for for inviting me here to participate. Um, and one of the of my headwords is contribute as a contributed member to Meta Docencia, um, which is an an inclusive and collaborative uh, community uh, which improves education. Uh, we aim to empower a uh, structure for underdeserved countries. And we started as a direct response to the to a sudden move to online teaching uh, during as part of the public health, he, public health measures against the COVID pandemic. Um, and we realized that teachers needed a, a, quish, a quick crash course on online teaching. But uh, at the same time, we could use that opportunity to uh, empower teachers with concrete evidence-based tools and student-centered educational methods uh, that will could be useful for any kind of, of classroom setting. And so we also wanted to nurture the values of open collaborations and resource sharing. So we which we feel it's, they, those values are not very incentivized in the current, current institutional system, at least here in Argentina. Um, and concretely, we design and we give uh, online courses, uh, focusing on course design and classroom management, which maximize uh, student learnings and minimize students and teachers' exhaustion. And all our, our courses are free to attend, and the materials are also free available uh, even with an open license. So we are we try to also teach by example. Um, and in addition, because we know that teaching together is the best way to teach, we have a Slack community uh, where teachers can share knowledge, tools, and ask for help. Um, and I do uh, have another hat to wear, which is also relevant to the conversation. I have here, here. <laughs> which is uh, part of the uh, I'm part of the both part of the organizing team of USR 2021, which is a conference all about the R language and what which was held online. So I will be talking about that experience too. I 
I am so jealous that I didn't bring my hat to wear. Such a good idea. On to you, Ben. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, my name is Ben Crickler. I'm, uh, well, I'm, I'm very, very excited to be here today. So I, I also have many hats, although sadly I don't have a physical one anymore. I have to get, <laughs> get that. That's a good touch. Um, I, I was a postdoc uh, particle physicist for four or five years. I was from the University of Bristol, but, uh, but based at CERN. Um, that meant over the last two years, I've been very much involved in running workshops at CERN back in the UK, um, in particular, the Python for high energy physics uh, series where we had, uh, we started, you know, maybe we had a few hundred people, 100 or 200 people before the, uh, the pandemic, and it blew up to 1000 because we put it online uh, during the pandemic. Um, and then outside of that, I've been involved, I helped run um, the port humanitarian hackathon, which takes place every year at CERN. I was also involved in the Swiss versus virus hackathon, which had I think 4,000 or 4,000 or 5,000 participants right at the beginning of the pandemic. So those are the sort of hats I wear on that side, but actually the pandemic had a huge um, effect on, on my work and my, my whole uh, career. Cause I basically now work really full time on, on the very kind of question behind what we're discussing today. So um, I helped to found a, an organization called remotely green, um, which uh, is a hybrid organization. It's, it's a hybrid in the sense that we have both a nonprofit and a for-profit uh, branch. And so the big vision with Remotely Green is to basically build a better connected world, a greener world where using the, you know, what remote collaboration gives us. Um, and, but also getting that right where the, you know, there might be situations where it's, where it's not the best and so on. So that putting everything behind um, the sustainability aspect of, of remote collaboration. And right now we have two main major projects. Uh, one of them is, is pretty recent. It's not yet live, but it's a carbon footprint calculator to help um, inform the decisions and the discussions uh, around whether or not to go online or to stay in person. So that's just focus on the environmental uh, piece at that point. And then the second bit is um, the second big project is, is a platform that really helps make online events truly sociable. Um, and so the big point there is to kind of give that coffee break experience where you may not know who you're going to match with or who you're going to talk to, uh, but you have a chance to have those sort of serendipitous encounters. And that means that for the last uh, year or so, um, we've had we've worked with 200 or so different events in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, many of them have been in academia because that's the, and the nonprofit world because that really is where we we, we come from. Um, but we're seeing also some interest from online communities, a handful of companies, and so on. So yeah, please feel free to to check us out. Um, you can just search for remotely green. Uh, but yeah, I am super super excited to 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 be here today because this whole discussion is basically now my whole focus. I'm really in excited to hear. To learn as much as to, to you know to, to be involved and a big big thank you to the to the Turing way and uh, for, for inviting me and organizing this and i think i pass on next to dorothea yeah thanks um so my name is dorothea Hug peter um i'm from switzerland um thank you very much for the invitation um i'm a scientific collaborator at uh, the Swiss in Federal Institute for Forest, Snow and Landscape Research. Um, but I'm here more as a organizer of FUSAR 2021. So um, during my PhD, I went to my first um, in person at the time conferences, it's some year back. And I really, really liked in your in person conferences. And I thinking back, I think that the interactions and exchanges that I had at these conferences were part of what motivated me to, to stay and to keep going and to actually finish my, my PhD. So um, I really liked in-person conferences. And um, in 2019, we had this idea that came out a bit of nothing to get user to Zurich. Um, and I was part of the team proposing the pitch and we got we were successful and so we thought that we would get all these people travel to Zurich and show our nice city and we had some discussions because of course Zurich is very expensive um, but we were really um, excited to make it work and find solutions also um, but then yeah as we all know the pandemic happened and we took the sort of conference was planned in 2021 and we took the decision quite early. So in summer 2020 to go online and global. 
Um, and I, I've had a, a first online conference experience quite early in the pandemic. And of course, everything was a bit ad hoc and everyone was still learning. But this first experience was very positive. I, I really, I mean, first of all, the conference would, would have been in Brisbane, so I wouldn't have been able to attend if it <laughs> in person. Um, and like the whole, the whole interaction and everything really convinced me that online conferences can work. And so it was for me not a big, um, a big hit to say, well, okay, let's try this for use R. Um, and we not only decided to move online, but also uh, to expand the team to really make it a, a global event. And so this was a really interesting experience to first cover the online part, but also really try to think on um, what does it mean to to say we are global, how can we be as inclusive as possible for different parts of the world, how can we think about accessibility, etc. And so that's the experience that I bring to this fireside chat and that I'm excited to share. On to Gilbert. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being part of this and also inviting me to be a part of this uh, session. Um, Gilbert Bayamba, uh, Head of Programs at Policy, Policy with a double L, uh, based in Kampala, Uganda. However, Policy works within the Sub-Saharan Af African uh, region. Uh, this year, we're trying to expand to cover more um, areas within the Global South. And most of our work is hinged around uh, equitable data usage, uh, especially in the fact that we are a feminist organization. We want to make sure that even the marginalized groups understand how to utilize data, but also use this, this data to influence uh, change and service delivery within their communities. So policy works at the intersection of data design and research. So most of our work have a component of either design, research, um, or uh, data usage. And the reason why I'm here is basically because of our uh, events that we host, especially uh, DataFest uh, Africa, which was initially known as DataFest Kampala, which is aimed at building uh, an ecosystem within the data science space uh, within the Sub-Saharan African region. Uh, we've been hosting them for the last uh, two years. We started in 2019, 2020 COVID happened and we didn't uh, host the event. And then 2021, we managed to do a hybrid event. So online and offline at the same time. And um, that's what I'll be sharing more in terms of how to host a hybrid event, especially in uh, communities that are either inaccessible when it comes to internet infrastructure, but also some of those that have low internet uh, access or internet speeds. Yeah, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, you can check out our uh, policy, it's policyl.org. I'll be also posting the Twitter handles in the chat. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Gilbert, and everyone else for introducing yourselves. I'm going to start us off with our first question for the panel. So our first question is, what do we mean by inclusive conferences? What aspects are important to keep in mind? And I'd like to ask Ben to start us off by answering that, please. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's such a, it's a good question to set the scene, certainly, because that's that is what we're um, here about. And I think it's a huge, broad question, right? I mean, there's so many pieces to pull into it. Um, I think at a very high level, uh, you, it, the point is to, to think and include the variety of backgrounds that people will come with, the different contexts that they'll be working from, and of course, the different personalities that you bring. And that really, I really mean that in the, like, in the broadest of senses. So you know, the, the backgrounds where you're coming from in the context, if you've got children at home, if, uh, if you've got little kids, it could be on one hand, a big advantage that you bring it um, online because you can remain and you can look after them. But then actually for some people that may be the, the opposite where you've got little kids running around in the background and it's actually quite challenging. So, so these things, there's, there's, not, there's always not a, it's not always obvious which, um, you know, how, how these contexts then, um, fit in. Um, on the, um, I, I think the key, the key thing is that, you know, when we go to conferences, especially in the academic world to meet people, to try and um, 
you know, find potential new collaborations. It's super important for career um, progression as well for, for young, for, for earlier stage uh, researchers. Um, and so, it, you know, if, if it weren't, if that weren't the case, we could just record everything and everyone would be happy to watch something. And so you've got to make sure that you're building an environment where regardless of your background, regardless of your context, you're, you're happy to join in. And so when you think of um, doing that in person, it obviously means you have, you have things like code of conduct and well, whether it's online or, or in person, it has to have a, a code of conduct. Um, when you're in person, the things like the Pac-Man rule, where you're very welcoming, you've got, always got space to like have someone come and join your group. That sort of thing is so powerful. I, I discovered that the first time a few years ago with the SSI, and, and it just made such it was such an obvious thing to include. If it's online, you get the flip side where like I don't really know what the, the equivalent of that would be, but certainly making sure everyone has a chance to speak, um, you know, making sure no one person dominates it is is crucial. Um, but then, and I think Gilbert just mentioned it. You've got to think about you know the bandwidth, or maybe they don't have access to a a, um, a good computer, a good camera. Um, maybe um, similarly, they don't want to to fly or to meet you um, or, or travel to to the, to the in person. And so it, it's really it's really tricky. Uh, the last point I did want to really stress is, and one thing I don't hear so much um, is the question of being in, of, for introverts and extroverts. And I think um, one thing that surprised me when I, or it makes sense when you sort of hear it, but it, it, I didn't expect it maybe, is that for many of the people we've seen join the, what we've been doing, um, one of the most convicts of, of positive feedback comes from introverts, that they love that they're being, um, like it's easier to meet people in a way online and it's less daunting. And if you've got a system that actually brings you together, you don't get that sort of, it's not tricky to walk up to someone and, and, and meet you. So actually being online can open up many opportunities for people that might find it quite daunting to you know, wait around before the, the, the conference has started. Or, or on the flip side, if you're very extroverted, it can actually be quite that difficult because it can be more challenging if you bring it online. So again, I, I think it, you really have to think through who, is the, who, are the, you know, who are the people you want to bring to the conference? And is there, is there a, um, are you dealing, are you looking to, to attract a, you know, a specific niche or, or if not, then, then you've got to, you know, think through all these different aspects. Um, so, I mean, that's a very rambling <laughs> set, but there's a lot of different points. It's a very broad question. That I, I mean, I'm trying to throw out, I, I don't know if that resonates with people, with others in the, in the panel, um, any of what I've said. Um, and I, well, one other, the, another thing I think that is super important is the time zones, because obviously, when you travel, it, again, if, if you're thinking of in-person versus online, uh, traveling often comes with a time zone requirement. Like if you know, going to a conference in, in Brisbane, you're going to have to, you're going to be very jet lagged, you're going to arrive at tired, but now you'll all be in sync and assuming we're coming from, from Europe at least. Um, so, you know, you'll be very jet lagged, but you'll all be in the same place and you'll all be, you know, seeing the sun at the same time, bring that online. And it doesn't matter what you do. You'll always have some, some other aspect that you may not now have the jet lag, but which is fantastic, but you may instead have to get up at three in the morning, which is arguably, well, it's different. I don't know if it's better or worse. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ben, for that answer. I think Dorothea, did I see you start to unmute? Do you have something you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I really liked. I, I think you you touched on many points. Um, I, we we obviously we obviously thought about this at the beginning of our organization, and we kind of tried to boil it down to the sentence where you try to make the conference as accessible as possible for as many people as possible, um, but with um, knowing that there will always be trade-offs but at least um, and involving the people that are concerned by all these different aspects so try to have people on the team from with family without family um, with um, disabilities um, coming from different parts of the world so the, who can inform you about all these different aspects that you will certainly not think about everything I think that the disability question is, is tough. It's an interesting one as well, because of, again, you know, travel may have imposed limitations there, restrictions, but there's a flip side. Again, if you go online 
depending on the platform you're using, that can bring its own challenges. It's great that we've got um, the subtitling here because I think if you're hard of hearing, that that's super important. If you've got a, if you need a screen reader to, to navigate and you're using some esoteric platform, then that brings in its own other challenges. So, um, but I think what I am excited, why I'm so excited about the online space is it's much easier to, you can imagine how these things can improve over time significantly um, because it's online, because it's software. But I, it's a, I like the sentence though, that you think it's a bit, a bit of a thing. Thanks, Ben. And thanks, Dorothea. Ilio, would you like to add something? Yeah, I am. Um, so, yeah, I, I liked Ben's points about um, accommodating all backgrounds, even like introverts and extroverts. And one thing that I think it's important to take into consideration and to, to think about uh, and keep in mind when thinking about inclusivity is that uh, how you kind of perhaps yeah measure in, in the inclusivity of your of your conference and being able to so so it's important not only to measure like how many so at the registrations numbers or, or participation numbers but also you need some kind of way to measure or to to know the the quality of the conference because it's not enough for to say okay we we received a lot of um um, registration from from an 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 undeserved country, for example. If then in in practice, uh, some part of the organization or because the software you're using or whatever, uh, or the culture perhaps even makes that so that those people get like the short end of the stick and and they don't get uh, they don't get to participate or have like the full experience that perhaps other people have. Uh, so yeah, thinking about. Uh, those contexts, uh, it's really important. Those are some really great points. I really like the notion of like, how do you measure inclusivity? And what, what does that mean? And also the idea of, you know, making a conference accessible for as many people as possible in as many places as possible. Um, we're going to just do the time, I think, jump ahead to this, to kind of shift gears a little bit to talk more specifically about the different types of formats that we're talking about. Um, beginning with the online format. Um, so really, this is a question that I'll, I'll throw to, to Lily to, to get us started on, on this element. Um, but really, what drove uh, CSV comps and really any organization that you all work with and maybe doing more in-person based events? Uh, what drove that decision to return to in-person conferencing and what trade-offs are involved in that process? Yeah, so I can start with this. Um, CSV comp is going to be in person next year. We have been online for 2020 and 2021, and we actually are not doing a conference this year, mainly because it was really hard for us to make this decision. And it took us so much time to make a decision that we just felt like we couldn't pull together a really solid conference this year. So instead, we're taking over a year to plan for an in-person conference that we are going to try and make as inclusive as we can. I'm going to start off by saying I don't have all the answers for how to do that. So it's part of why I'm so excited about today is that I really want to learn from the other panelists as well to see what they think are good ways to do this. Um, but to answer your question, Anne, the reasons why we decided to go in person, there are many, and these probably won't be unfamiliar to you all. Uh, the first one is that we were all kind of burnt out, like we're tired of virtual events and we really wanted to be around each other again. Um, I, you know, it's just a feeling. And I think that we're all social creatures. I, I think one of you was talking about being introverted. Like I definitely feel introverted, but even then, like I want to be around other people. So that feeling was very strong. Um, I think the main reason for that is that everyone misses networking at events, and it's just really hard to replicate that in-person opportunity to be around other people. So that's something that I would love to hear other people's ideas about. If you have been at an event that successfully replicated that like networking or social time or the hallway track, um, because yeah, I haven't, I have not experienced that personally. The other thing that CSV Conf is really good at doing is creating a sense of local community. 
So the first two years were in Berlin and then the next two years were in Portland. And CSV Conf is really um, like it brings in a lot of local data makers and data storytellers. And it's very, it has a very like small feeling, even though it's several hundred people. And that sense of local community is really difficult to replicate online. It's kind of a double-edged sword because online we're able to get thousands of people from all over the world. So it's a different sense of community, but that local community is really core to what we're doing. So that was important for us. Uh, at CSV Conf, we also have a lot of fun. If you're familiar with CSV Conf, you know that we have a Kama Llama that is our mascot and it's a llama that comes to the conference. It's a therapy llama and everybody gets to pet it and feed it carrots. And it's a long story for the background of that, but basically for the virtual version, we live streamed a llama, which was still fun, but it's just not the same, uh, you know. So we, we do try and have fun and that's again, more difficult virtual. Uh, the other thing is that an online conference is hard. I'm sure many of you have experienced this before if you've organized like figuring out the time zones like Ben was saying you need to have moderators around constantly to make sure that the online space is safe and welcoming you need to have code of conduct enforcers which you do at a normal conference as well but there's just it takes many more organizers to do an online conference well in my experience um and then let's see, my other point here was that we just really wanted to be able to travel somewhere new as well. So we are historically a more like United States, Western Europe group, and we would like to grow our community. So we're targeting uh, a city in the global south to kind of expand our community for our in-person event. So those are our reasons. Um, yeah, I think that's probably all that I want to say about that right now and see if anybody else wants to chime in here or I'll hand it back over to you, Anne. I would be really interested in hearing, <coughs> sorry, uh, Gilbert's perspective on this, because I know that you're also not only have organized uh, Data Fest Kampala, but also uh, you're also right now in the midst of your uh, team meeting in person. Uh, with your globally remote team and I wonder how you think about um, some of the things that Larry had said about you know what it means to be in person uh, as opposed to to working remotely in, in an async way online. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think I find this very interesting given our perspective being a remote uh, organization. So in person has kind of so we're currently hosting a team retreat and it's in person so it's my first time having all our team members that work in different countries across Africa and as far as Europe come in one space, uh, seeing all the jokes and the Slack messages, uh, putting a face to that is kind of uh, interesting and fun. But also I think it creates a bond for the team to really get to know each other. I think like the, everyone has said, in person is what we've been used to by work can forced to go to online or remote uh, due to COVID, especially uh, on our side. Uh, so that uh, bond comes to life when people connect and come uh, together uh, in person. But however, uh, I think remote also gives the flexibility for people to work or interact um, at their convenience. Uh, for example, the flexibility of me working uh, past uh, the normal working hours if I was going to be in a daily uh, workspace. But also when it comes to conferences and workshops, it kind of gives you the opportunity to interact with more diverse groups compared to uh, people traveling to a simple to a one space and uh, the costs involved in basically uh, bringing people together. So. They're both good, but I think uh, online kind of gives you uh, a high advantage of uh, interacting with more diverse groups and more people that you wouldn't have normally interacted with at, uh, on any day. For example, I'm in Uganda and I'm participating in this uh, fireside chat, which wouldn't have happened if someone had sent me an email a week ago because putting in consideration visas, the cost of getting a visa loan from Sub-Saharan Africa 
is so high, uh, air tickets and all that. So to take me at least another two weeks to basically prepare and get to the chat, but this took almost a few hours to prepare and say, yes, I'm in and I'm going to be part of the chat and I'm here, yeah. Can I jump back in? I thought those points were really great, Gilbert, and I really related to them. Uh, I wanted to bring up that I recently went to South by Southwest in person, which is here. I'm in Austin. So it was very easy for me to get to it. And it was thousands of people. It's the first in-person work event I've been to since COVID started. And it was like good for my soul in a way that I did not predict. It was just like people were so happy to be together again. And it was just very inspiring and optimistic. So that was a, an experience that I was not expecting to like see how happy everybody was to be together again. I wonder actually if I wanna push back in certain ways on um, things that both of you have said, because it made me realize how much, I think I'd, I, I remember turning, tuning in to my first online event uh, back all the way back in the Mar March, 2020 or something like this. Um, and it was a conference for, uh, some organization that was involved in something related to data. Clearly, I don't remember what it was, but it was amazing because no one had any idea what they were doing on Zoom. And so you had these incredibly important scientists and researchers who were just like other Zoom squares uh, in this like slightly chaotic, but like be weirdly beautiful event where it was something that I think wouldn't have been replicated in a in-person event because I think as an early career researcher and someone quite early career, I realized that I would have never been in probably the same space with some of these people, even if it had been an in-person event, even though I would have been definitely very inspired by what they had said. And so I wonder if, and then I've had a similar experience actually a couple of weeks ago where I went to my first kind of in-person event since over the past two years. And it was also actually funnily enough, brought me back to that same experience from two years ago. Whereas that I think it was that transition from being so used to online and then being in person felt as inspiring as being forced to be in person all the time and then participating in an online event for the first time where it was so much more inclusive than anything that I had ever been in a part of before. So yeah, just something that came to mind with you both, but this is actually a great transition into uh, kind of our next question about, you know, what are the trade-offs uh, involved in planning? online events and uh, what what have you what have you found to your different experiences and I think actually to get us started maybe we can pass it on to you Dorothea. Yeah thanks so I think I already said in my in my introduction pitch I really liked in-person conferences um, and I think that's sometimes important to stress because sometimes you get the impression that people who didn't like in-person conferences anyway are now enjoying online conferences and I think that's that's not true um so I mean we already mentioned a few points I, I would like to start maybe with time zones um I, I think I'm convinced that one of the big advantages of having an in-person conference is that everyone is in the same time zone um and that's really something that either you have one preference time zone and then for all the others uh, they just have to get up in the middle of the night which is kind of okay if uh, historically it's a, a local conference so for example um, for the European R user meeting I thought it was perfectly sensible to just say well we have it's European time and for the all the others you just have to arrange yourself but of course if you call it a global conference um, you have to have global time zones um and this yeah it's it's quite a, a, a huge effort in, in the whole organization uh, we really had um different days at different preferential time zones which made and luckily we also and we needed um coordinators from different time zones uh, because someone has to be there and, and responsible etc um I think one of the other trade-offs that I see with online is that um, you have to try much harder to get people to actually block time for the conference. Um, because when you travel to a city, um, you're there and 
yeah, maybe you miss some talks because you get tired towards the end of the week, but it's still like the main thing that you do there usually is the conference. Whereas for um, online conferences, most people don't block their weeks. And I know that also as a participant in my first online conferences, I was really exhausted at, after the, my first uh, virtual conference because um, I didn't have this time uh, blocked. And so there was always back and forward and uh, yeah, the family also. So um, so it, it can be quite exhausting and, and you have to try harder to get people to block time. So that's, that's one of the trade-offs that I see. Um, however, of course, with the whole, it also makes it possible for people to attend who could not travel. Um, and I think that this, this trying harder um, can be also good because you think over. Um, I, I always think it's a good um, opportunity when the conference goes online to not just replicate everything, but to actually think, what, well, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Uh, what is the goal of the conference? And, and to actually rethink a bit things. But in turn, I also realized, because I think we did this for use R, at least as much as we could, but um, it also makes it harder to convince people who don't like online conferences if we change everything. So I think there is really a balance to strike between um, like serving people who historically attended the, the conference and welcoming all these people who can now attend who couldn't attend before. So uh, um, I would also agree uh, with what you said, Anne, that it can be much more equitable. So um interactions between direct uh, like between high level um people in the field and asking questions for example i think it's so much easier in, a, in an online conference for a, a, especially for early career scientists because raising your hand and standing up in a full room full of other people um yeah you have to <laughs> you have to be really confident to do it and, and in the online format that's much easier so i actually think that networking is easier online but um that's that's uh, also my personal experience um yeah and one last point and then i pass on to someone else um i think another question in the online format is money uh, so it's harder to convince people to pay, um, but of course online doesn't mean that it's free because you have to pay for platforms or for we did uh, live um, transcriptions for all the talks, so this is obviously quite expensive um, and, and everything. And on the other hand, um, I think that's not yet established how this move to virtual or online will impact sponsor sponsorships so we were really lucky i think um there was already a good base of sponsors and um most of them agreed and i think also the, from the feedback that i got they also got out of the conference what they um expected so in terms of recruiting etc that worked quite well um but I'm not sure how well this will work long term, and, and I think for some sponsors, so that's that's one of the big questions. How do you finance um, online conferences? How much are people willing to pay? How do you make the whole payment process equitable, um, etc. But yeah, I'm looking forward to hear your perspectives as well. I think I'll pass it over to Elio and then to, to Lily. We came to hear your sponsors. I think that a lot of, of what we see are uh, the problems we, we are facing with online conference is mainly cultural. Like we are not, this is something relatively new and people don't know how to use it basically to use this this new format. So they have they, they don't do as Dr. said, they don't block their time. But that's just a cultural thing. We once we once people participate of 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 um, many online conference and 
they they will uh, sort themselves out and, and they will uh, start to to realize what 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 works for them and how to organize themselves uh, as organizers i think it, it's still uh, we should um tell people and, and perhaps have a, like a, a, mo a more uh, direct approach and, and tell people block yourself block uh, this this is a space of time and and do just this don't don't do work etc but i think that in time uh, if uh, we have a more online conference and 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 this uh, this um move to online doesn't fizzle out i think we will start to see uh, a better uh, work for that and another thing that i I don't think that online is worse for 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 networking and, and creating community. Really, um, we have like I don't know. I, I was a, a a a teenage in 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 the early internet, and I don't know. I, I know how internet can in the, in the online and only online, and even without seeing any faces, you can create a, a lot of communities and and very neat neat tight uh, groups and meet a lot of new people. Uh, I met all of you only online, so. Uh, again, I think that we it's also a cultural thing and I mean I, we need to figure out how to do things better and we could uh, even uh, talk to those people and try to reach out for for those people who maintain online communities to learn uh, how to do it better uh, but that's uh, I think kind of there's like a principle in which each you have a new technology and the new technology might be better, let's say agriculture, like you invent agriculture, but you don't know really how to use it efficiently. So at, at first you start to uh, have less crop and uh, more hunger, but then when you start to learn how to use it better, you you reach a new, uh, up, a new maximum. So perhaps we're stuck in a, like a local maximum and it's hard to move outside of this. And, and we have to go through a, a, a minimum and slight minimum to to get to a better place. I think Lily was next. Thanks, Leo. I just wanted to quickly build off of something that Dorothea said, which was talking about re taking the opportunity to reimagine what an online conference can be. And I think we should take this opportunity to reimagine a lot of things in this space. What does an in-person conference look like? For CSV Conf, when we do it in person, we're definitely still going to have some online portions because we don't want to lose that online aspect. And I'm not sure what that looks like right now. We're still reimagining that. Um, but if anyone here is a funder or is in charge of budgets, I would also request that you reimagine how to spend that funding and budget. Many people in the chat were talking about how expensive visas are or traveling. And that's something we'll definitely look at in the budget of CSV comp. How much of our money can we dedicate to flying people out and helping them with their visas? So I just want to put that out there that this is an opportunity to rethink a lot of things. And maybe, so I, I wanted to, I mean, I, I'm picking up on a lot that's been said in some ways already, but I, I, I had a sense that we were coming very anti-online and I want to like pull back and say that we really should figure out a lot more with online. And I see it a lot as like, um, I, th I totally agree with Lydia and, and, and I, I fully agree with everyone actually that says, you know, it's great to get together. I like, there's nothing better than to see a new place, discover a new culture and, and like taste I don't know, whatever the local food is. I, I totally, totally agree with that uh, and those sorts of things. But there are so many good things about online that we can make, I think we can figure out. So, I mean, there's the environmental side of it, which we've not even mentioned, but I think it's huge and it's super urgent. Uh, there is, I think Gilbert put it really nicely. I've not heard that sort of trade comparison before, but the uh, uh, online allows you to have a huge diverse audience, but maybe currently that the connection amongst that audience is is weaker and um i'd not sort of heard, thought of it in those in that contrast and that's i think really interesting but for me you know to go in person you have to travel you will always have to for this foreseeable future at least you will need visas and there will be an environmental impact but we can get we can do that online now we can figure these things out we will improve the online space and so anyway i mean and and the big picture i have is is sort of in the early days of silent films 
that you know they just took theater theaters you know, stage productions and just put them on on there and record them and had to figure out this whole new language that you know how to make a tell a story but now in, in a film and we're in that sort of I mean, online events are not brand new, but the world has revisited them in a big, big way over the last couple of years. And they're improving, right? I mean, Zoom and its breakout rooms and the quality of that connection. I mean, it's amazing how we can see everyone so clearly and hear, hopefully everyone can hear me now clearly as well. Um, and that sense, I mean, um, we're in the early stages. And I think if you skip forward 50 years, what we could be doing with online and, and compared to that is, um, is big. And I, but I say that all very much agreeing that I, I do like to be in person and meet, you know, it's great to meet my family and, you know, hug them, right? And so there are things that we miss. I, I, I'm, yeah, making a passionate plea for online, but uh, cognizant of, <laughs> of everything else. <laughs> As Dorothy, I will pass it to you and then. Um... Gilbert, we're really going to put you on the spot in a moment to talk about hybrid events. Um, but before that, on to you, Dorothea. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hear more from your experience. Uh, I, I just wanted to share one thing that so we had during our conference, we also had a, a discussion on how to move forward and what future conferences could look like. Um, and we were also talking about hybrid and someone said, in general, not for hybrid, but for online more. Well, even if it's not perfect, um, and even if the interactions are not perfect, um, if it's in person, I will not be able to attend. And I think that's the case for so many people. And that's what I think I always want to have in mind when I organize future conferences, that even if it's not perfect, uh, if we don't do it online or at least hybrid, um, so many people just don't have access. Um, that would be my closing statement in favor of online. There is so much, I think, to pick up on. I almost wish that we, in real time, could create a kind of matrix of what people are saying and like what the, I think, the trade-offs are for each type of conference that we've talked about so far. There are also so many things happening in the chat right now, and I just want to say thank you for engaging. I definitely can't read and speak at the same time so i'm sorry i'm not able to bring that into the conversation in real time but um this is actually a another great transition into asking you know kind of given these trade trade-offs in the online and the in-person um uh, formats that we've been able to discuss together uh what is involved in the hybrid format and what are the trade-offs um involved in that process uh especially when it comes to all these questions of accessibility and equity, um, but also the need to have social connection and the importance of like human, human touch and human contact, um, weighing those kind of, all of those things together. Uh, I'll pass it on to you, Gilbert. I think we're waiting with bated breath uh, for your golden answers about how to address this important middle ground. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. I think before I speak to that, I want to point out something. Um, I know most of you come from um, environments whereby accessibility to some of these tools, uh, even the internet is very easy and affordable. Me coming from an environment whereby even, uh, like for example, Anne was prepping for this and power went off. Uh, I couldn't get into the prep meeting. I had no internet because my power was off. So having those kind of constraints kind of uh, make cut off some of uh, the communities, especially within our environment. Um, when COVID happened, when someone said this has literally exposed our digital divide when we look at the global south and the global north. And for us, because we're working in communities and want them to get into the space, the digital space, the data science space, we need to put this into consideration. And that's why for us in personal events can't just be, uh, a, they can't not exist. So that's why we kind of have a merge of two, uh, online and um, uh, offline. But also hosting those comes with its own challenges. Uh, for example, when we're hosting a data face, we kind of realized at one point we may end up hosting two different events yet at the same time, because you're planning for in-person, but you also need to put in consideration uh, uh, online. And in the process, you don't want the 
programs to clash because you want the people to interact on the same agenda and the same topics. Uh, if it's a hands-on workshop, how do you make sure that you have facilitators that can one online and one offline so that they kind of interact and they don't forget that hey i'm dealing with one audience which is online so making sure that you're not organizing two events so i mean there's a lot of prepping between the online uh, facilitator and the offline uh, facilitator uh, to make sure that the audience uh, kind of interacts uh, in the process so that has been at the back of our mind to make sure that even when we're organizing a hybrid event. So there's a workshop we organized and half of the facilitators were virtual because they couldn't fly in because of COVID and the, and the participants were physical uh, because we wanted to get feedback from um, uh, policy makers and um, rural communities on how a certain policy for a certain big tech platform uh, uh, was faring in terms of uh, keeping people safe online on that platform. And the facilitators were from the big tech platform. So we had to also put into consideration factors of hiring uh, a tech person. So we had to hire uh, a live streaming uh, company to come in and prepare the Zoom platform for the participants uh, who are virtual, but also have mics and have cameras uh, in the room for the physical participants. And we had two facilitators. We had a workshop facilitator from Uganda who was seated in the room, and we had the big tech uh, facilitator who was uh, virtually. And at one point, there was a disconnect because the online facilitator was basically reading a script, yet here there's a lot of uh, interaction people want to give, want to uh, chip in when someone is speaking, and realize we can't script some of these things that which tend to happen when you organize an online event, you script. Uh, but you, you're not leaving that room for the interpersonal connection as someone has to interject. And then as a facilitator online, you kind of go off script. So putting in mind that you're organizing one event and making sure there's a lot of prepping between the facilitators, uh, making sure you have an online facilitator and the physical facilitator is very, very key uh, for, um, for hosting uh, uh, hybrid events, but also how do you make sure that online participants keep engaged in the room, you can pass on the microphone and all that. Uh, one thing we've realized uh, using uh, online documents like Google Doc um, or any other tools that you can use to make sure that online participants kind of put their feedback or provide their notes in there. And then the facilitator also once in a while to check it out and read these notes, but also peak banking on social media. Uh, one of the things that we've realized that also happens uh, virtually uh, when you have uh, a physical uh, or a hybrid event, make sure that you create a hashtag for the virtual participants so that the, those conversations are also brought into the room beyond the people who are on the Zoom platform, but also those ones who are following online and encouraging uh, the facilitator uh, physically. In most cases, you put a screen and you kind of track the hashtag so they can read some of this feedback that comes off um, uh, on uh, social media. Uh, one of the other things is, um, yeah, I've talked about harmonizing the audiences and giving them the spaces so that they can both provide feedback in, in person, microphone passes on, and then virtually uh, you have uh, hashtags uh, running or any other um, documents that you can use. Also, one of the things we've realized, uh, I think, I don't know how many of you have attended RightsCon. I found that uh, them creating side uh, events whereby uh, you can network uh, virtually in a room, uh, especially bringing uh, funders, and you don't have like uh, a structure for the event or for the session. Uh, I think it was a networking session online. So that what you would normally get in a physical conference where someone goes and doing uh, break tea or lunch and you have a conversation, they put it in a room and you could get into any room and ask either the person hosting that session, uh, most cases there are funders or uh, organizations that provide uh, funding. So you ask them in terms of what they do and how they can facilitate or collaborate with you. So providing those kind of spaces uh, kind of also helps in a, a hybrid event because physically there will be people speaking to each other uh, during tea breaks, but in a hybrid. So you're leaving out a whole 
a group of people and especially the high when you host a hybrid event you have more people online you have 100 physical and you have over 500 online so when you're doing the networking session and you have another session online where they can also participate and have informal discussions create their own uh uh, breakaway rooms and just have informal discussions and discuss and see how they can connect also makes it very uh, interesting. So having those at the back of your mind uh, when you're organizing a hybrid event is very, very key. Yeah. I have a follow-up question for Gilbert, if that's okay. Gilbert, I'm curious if you can tell us more about what you were just talking about, those networking hybrid events. And I think you said that you maybe had like some leading questions for people to talk about. Is that right? I'm just wondering how you get the conversation flowing. And also if you found that you had a lot of virtual participation in those networking um, rooms. Yeah, uh, so in, in terms of uh, the networking event uh, sessions, we tend to make them not so structured, so informal so that someone can get into the room. Uh, I don't know what platform RightScon was using, but for us uh, utilizing uh, Zoom platforms and uh, the person who is hosting or who wants to lead on a conversation kind of makes it very clear. And what we have found very interesting is people who are actually providing uh, either a resource or a service to the community that we are, we are hosting, kind of make those uh, networking sessions more interesting. For example, if you're funding organization and you want to take people through how you provide resources or how your application process goes, kind of those kind of conversations create more um, interaction, especially after a structured uh, conference or a workshop, uh, something like that. So having uh, identifying people who are going to actually provide a takeaway for the people beyond the discussions you've had in the conference makes it more interesting to create those organic uh, networking uh, conversations in an online environment. Kind of a follow-up question then um, for you all is really, I, I was seeing in the chat a little bit of discussion about a kind of hub format where there is a, an event happening, but there are kind of local in-person hubs happening in, in different locations where people can gather together physically, but then kind of globally are able to participate in a kind of um, uh, event in real time across many different time zones across the world. And I'm wondering what you all think of that kind of what your thoughts would be on, on something like this, this hub format, or if you've experienced it yourself. Maybe we can go Dan and then Lily. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. Um, for me, it's super exciting, personally. I think it's a really promising format because I think you get the, you get a good mixture. You, you, you leave your office, you're in a different location, and that could be very important for, I mean, there was, that addresses already you know, the question of not being bombarded for requests to do it, or changing the your environment, you know, changes your mindset. And that, that's part of why we like to go in person, I think. It also means that you're, you might be physically next to other people, but obviously you've only traveled locally, you don't have the carbon footprint, you don't require people to get visas and so on. So I think it's very exciting. I think the challenges, it's not obvious. I think it's, you know, uh, uh, it's going to be a lot of work for organizers. And, and we've been contemplating this with the port, uh, the hackathon I mentioned, because we would need to have uh, you know, one hub, maybe that is the main hub that, that where much of things are being coordinated, but then we need to identify the other hubs and then we have to try and coordinate them. And so I think it's, I think it's a very exciting concept. And I think there's going to be a lot of, I'm sure a lot of people are going to play with it and explore it. And I think there's going to be a lot to work out. Um, and I can see certainly, you know, from from really putting a remotely green hat on and the platform we're building, we can see a lot of other platforms spring up that will really try and address um, supporting this as well. So how you the big challenge I see is the asymmetry you may have because you've got fantastic connections within a hub, and then you've got an online connection to the other hubs and the other participants. So that's I mean I think if we can solve that in the fully online version, then you can already see how you might get that in the in a hybrid version. But these are the, the challenges I see. That, I'm personally very excited. Yeah, uh, Ben hit a lot of the things that I've been thinking about with this, and I haven't done a ton of thinking about this, but for CSV Conf, 
we briefly started imagining what a hub model would look like. And we were even just thinking about doing like watch parties where we're streaming like the keynotes. And for each keynote, we have like a hub watch party. Um, and that's about as far as we got. So I'm curious, maybe in the chat, people could put thoughts on that as well, because I'd love feedback. Um, but yes, but then you create, like what Ben was saying, kind of a, a separate and maybe less equal participation model. I'm just not totally sure. So I'll pass it over to Dorothea. Yeah, um, I'm a bit skeptic. I think I see where I see big, big advantages is um, maybe this can be one solution to um, all the challenges that Gilbert uh, mentioned regarding internet connections. So it can definitely be a, a good idea to get people together and in a place where there is a good internet connection and, and kind of make um, make a conference more accessible in that way. At the same time, I just see the whole organization and practical part where interactions between people in a hub and people in another hub get so much more complicated because we all know that if many people with, um, uh, even if you have very good headphones, which is another um, price question, um, it quickly gets disturbing. I mean, now, I don't know, some have to go back to the office and then you have Zoom calls and you have five people with a different Zoom call and it's just a nightmare. So um, I imagine that for this hub format, um, I see some advantages and I also think that we also discussed watch parties and I think that um, this stage of this could be cool, but how to make it work. Um, a lot of conference organizers are, are currently discussing this and we also had this discussion for user. Um, but I just don't see a model where it works very well um, yet. Yes, I just want to chip in there. I think one other model I've seen that works is especially for when people can't travel is bringing the conferences to the people, especially to the rural communities, either on the radio or a TV and have an on ground facilitator who kind of takes people's feedback if you really want them to provide feedback during the conference. And then this is emailed because this person has access to internet and all that. So they take the feedback after the listening in or watching um, a session type out the feedback and share it to the main organizers who again after can either travel back and uh, follow up on this, but also this was because of COVID. This is how it really happened in the rural communities who really even didn't have uh, computers and they couldn't travel, uh, make the teams travel to these uh, uh, conferences. But also one of the things we have done, especially for students during this period, because we usually host uh, hands-on sessions in data science. We have tried to also provide them with the internet, the data, uh, either partnering with a telecom company to subsidize on the costs or even budget for those costs and we send the students or these communities uh, the data refunds or the data ahead of the, of the sessions so that they are able to log in and participate. So some of those um, budget uh, reallocations need to be also put into uh, consideration. Thanks. I know we're coming up until the end of our time, uh, and maybe we can take this kind of, uh, there's so many, well, one, it really does feel like uh, it would be great to be able to collect some of these like learnings into some place that can kind of live beyond this conversation. I think there's so much that I'm learning from you all about so many different elements of these ways of running events, like real methods in real time. Um, I think, uh, I guess we can now take maybe some questions from the honest here. I'm going to go over to the pad to ask the question of, you know, um, what role does funding play within this debate? Um, I know we've had the opportunity to kind of touch on this, or, or Lily, I think you brought it up a little bit earlier about how do we incentivize, um, uh, structures that and conference organizing that is more equitable and accessible that you know allows for engagement um quality engagement and you know, all around the world for different events and i'm wondering for you all you know how do you 
how do you think of the role of, of funding in, in these planning of events? Whether that's also within this equation, the funding of visas, the funding of you know flights and, and costs, um, carbon costs also could be another way of looking at this too. Um, yeah, love your thoughts. I think, I'm sorry, Jeff. Go for it, how about maybe Ben Lilly? All right, all right. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I broke the etiquette. Um, but um, I was gonna say that I, I think we just talked about hybrid and I think that the funding is is definitely the, the, the biggest thing. And there's a, we've talked to a few people about it and they, they see it really as you're running two events. And that means you just double the cost straight out. And, and so that's a tricky one. But then the sponsor side of it is you've got a physical component. You can put sponsors, you know, you can present your sponsors material to your, your participants more easily. And, and I, I think you may see more e an easier time having getting sponsors in. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I think it, it, the hybrid side actually has a double side to it. I think I'm mainly going to write something that I just, or say something I just wrote in the chat, which is that I love the idea of asking a university for free space to host something. Um, usually when you're creating a budget, kind of what Ben was asking, you ask people for money and then you have like, th like perks that that company or organization gets as well. Um, but asking someone for something free is great. Uh, and then also to respond to what Ben was saying about like those physical perks. Um, I've been at a virtual open source conference, which is like a huge US conference. And they had a bunch of big tech sponsors that were still their sponsors, even though they were virtual. And they had virtual vendor rooms, which I chose to not attend, uh, but they actually emailed every single person that registered, like I think they shared all of our email addresses with those companies. And then we were on all of their email lists, which I am not recommending you do. I would actually recommend that you do not do that, but I'm um, just showing you an example of something I have experienced. <laughs> yes, that is so wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I was in charge of sponsorship for USR, and um, so this discussion, what can we actually offer in an online format was was one of the things. And um, as I mentioned briefly, I think for those companies who actually came mainly for recruiting, they were quite happy because we also offered this um, online booth um, and, and people actually interacted very strongly and, and we had social media posts and we also offered some uh, sponsored talks and even like just before keynotes because we also had this discussion usually you can have a 15 minute sponsored talk before a keynote and people already come because they want to have a good seat but um in a virtual format people will are not going to come 15 minutes early if they know that there is a sponsored talk so we had this just three minutes lightning talk that we thought we can put uh, without telling people <laughs> um and um yeah i think that the sponsors were were quite happy. I think one point that I forgot actually to mention in the whole online question is also um, if the conference is not at, hosted by a university, um, you have this problem that you need an institution that is responsible, that, that takes responsibility for the conference. And for some societies that might not be a problem because they have a society that can run conferences, etc. But for other communities, this is actually um, a problem because um, they need to make something up or find a foundation or so um, that's also something to consider. And I think uh, Gilbert, you briefly mentioned um, sponsoring data for participants. And I think that's another point that one side is funding, but the other side is also um, scholarships. So um, virtual conferences have to rethink scholarship. So what do people need to be able to attend the conference? So this time it's not uh, buying people a flight ticket or, or but it can be sponsoring uh, of the fees or 
um, I think for some people we, we paid, for example, for childcare um, during the conference. And, and I think that's also one of the points where rethinking what is makes sense in a virtual format is, is important. I'm going to jump in here really quickly before passing it over to you, Ben, to maybe ask Elio. I'd be really curious what your experience is um, uh, with USAR and in Argentina, if these kind of questions still apply, like very much apply, or, or the methods that, that you've been taking to kind of mitigate them. <coughs> yeah, uh, let me. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'm having yeah this virtual conference or virtual uh, um, sharing. I'm I am having software issues in and um, my Zoom <laughs> client is misbehaving, so I I couldn't mute and um, mute myself. Uh, so there you go. Some of the issues we have with <laughs> with online. Um, yeah, I, I can speak. Uh, a bit about um, the experience in Argentina with with kind of like not only experience with with hub with with kind of a hub conference which was not use R uh, but the other the competition competition <laughs> for an R conference which is um, uh, R Studio Conf which uh, early I, I don't remember which year but uh, it or it tried to organize like uh, like watch parties um that uh so that local user groups could um could uh join together and and watch the keynote and the basically they they uh, created the the key, they had the keynote in stream streaming received the questions via um, slide slideo i think it was called the the platform and in my experience, what re really good, uh, but it was like very different from like an actual conference because it was just like a meetup uh, with a local meetup. So all that uh, what we're talking about uh, the networking and all, all that really, I don't think it, it worked in that sense because um, yeah, we met people we already met and we already meet uh, in in previous meetups, but it was cool anyway. And it's funny also mentioning the platform, Lily. I'm sorry, I'm also going to jump in really quickly because I think this is another thing that I want to tie to something Gilbert has actually mentioned in a planning session about choosing a platform. You'd mentioned Slideo, um, but I think you'd mentioned to Gilbert that like you'd been thinking about you know what it meant to use Hopin as opposed to Zoom when like in in different contexts like people are not necessarily used to adopting a new platform or, or using a new uh, tool. That was, Wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that before we, um, oh my gosh, we're T minus five minutes away from the end of the session. Yes, just quickly, I, I think for us, we have kind of, you need to understand the community you're working in and also understanding accessibility. What does it mean for the people you're targeting for the event? So we realized Zoom was more, uh, not only well uh, known in the community, but also because people have kind of interfaced with it. So you don't have to gain, put instructions on how to download and install and all that. So they already have the platform. So tapping into those, we actually went ahead and did uh, WhatsApp um, uh, workshop chats because everyone is on WhatsApp and the discussions were really great because we put them in the group and then they are able to either use voice notes or even type and the discussion went on for even more than uh, two hours because people are in different locations and kind of chip in and you just throw in a question. So understanding the platforms and how the community you're targeting interacts with the platform. I'm going to uh, share a blog uh, in the chat and I think it was also put in the resources that shows how to kind of plan out um, online events, especially if you're working with communities in Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, thank you. Maybe, so this is, uh, well, maybe we'll pass it on to Lily and then Ben, and we might uh, might be closing out in a minute. Would you all be okay with uh, maybe having this kind of end of our discussion, maybe not have the, the kind of future of conferencing question added, if that's all right with you all? All right. 
maybe Lily, Ben, and then we'll maybe do a lightning round at the end uh, with everyone. I don't think I have. I don't think I have anything else to say here, so I'm just going to give it to Ben. Okay. Uh, I was going to pick up on the funding one, but I, I think a, a little bit that would be stepping back. And I, I just have a, a um, the, the, the big question I kind of want to put out there is, is why, why, um, what do we still feel is missing? Because we've got with online, like there's so much we can play with and do. And, and Slido, I mean, it's great that that got a shout out because that really, I mean, that, that works in person as well, but that's a sort of tool where it totally changes the culture of how you democratize getting questions and you don't have to stand up in front of everyone and, and ask it. But there are so many other really interesting things to, to do online. You know, um, and if you know Miro for whiteboarding, we mentioned having a big matrix and stuff. We could be doing that, you know, with everyone on there and building that up in, in real time. Um, but I, I think on the whole point of the social side, like wh what is it that we, we get that's so good when we're in person? Is it just we hate looking at a screen and we get eye strain? Or is it the lack of the ability to shake hands? What is it still, that's still to, to be found? And I really think it comes, it will come down to a big cultural and perception change and in funding and, and someone put it in the chat about time. I think we should see universities, you know, there should be more funds. We're not paying, we haven't paid for travel budgets for two years. There should be more funding out there. And if we can get the perception right, that let's put that money into getting online really working or, or, you know, or hybrid and hubs. Uh, let's give people time, let's recognize the time that they're joining an online conference in the same way we would have seen it really having you know, strict rules about this person's at an online conference, don't go and knock on their office, don't send them, don't expect them to reply to emails, whatever. That, that per perception of culture change, you know, opens up all these exciting pro prospects we get by, by playing it. So uh, it's a mixture of a question for everyone. You know? <laughs> what are we still missing? But I'm conscious of the time, man. So I'll just leave that as a, as a, as a thought hanging there. Um, yeah. Lily, I'm very sorry. We're, uh, I think we're really hitting at the end of time, and I want to be respectful of anyone who um, may be tuning out after the end of the call. But I do have a kind of final question um, to, to ask everyone is really, where do you see the future of, of conferencing going um, in the next you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line? I know we've touched upon it here, but would love to hear your thoughts. Um, maybe we can begin with, uh, Maybe Elio and then Lily, Ben, Dorothea, Gilbert. Yeah, I, I would love to have like a crystal ball and <laughs> to to see it, to say definitely what what the future holds. Um, but I I if I try to be uh, hopeful and not a cynic, which is actually with generally my my default mode. Um, I'm trying. To, I, I think that we should have like. Uh, so this, this, the move to online should at least, at the very least, open the possibilities for, for new formats. It will shake uh, the way that we do actually in-person uh, conference also. And uh, perhaps even if you're lucky, like a, a re-evaluation of what we use conferences for and what are they useful for. I think that conferences feel a, a variety of, of of needs, some of them can be very easily um, uh, fulfilled with with online. Some of them, perhaps, it's harder, and perhaps we need to uh, separate those those needs and have online conferences for some in some cases or some uh, contexts and um, in person or hybrid for others. And hopefully, we have like a a, a, a a general uh, re-evaluation of those uh, priorities and uh, we came out with a more inclusive uh, and more uh, equity equitable um, space. I'll agree with that. Say I envision that a lot of really big organizations will continue having online and maybe local smaller groups will be in person. I think Ben was on too. Yeah, sorry, it was on. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, no on. worries. I apologize. Um, I have to acknowledge that I have a huge bias. I sit here with like amazing internet and and um, you know fantastic. Well, I, you know, I can have a good setup, and that makes me definitely think that when I look at um, 
you know, my, my younger brother who plays Minecraft and has like got to, you know, build his whole world with his friends and they, they barely, you know, he's got friends all around the world that they've never met in person. And that they're going to grow up and, and, you know, um, for people to, for companies trying to hire the whole remote world t changes the, that dynamic. So I think the whole economics and the whole you know, way it's going, it's going to be more and more online, whether or not we, we move there. And, and at some point the, the weird one will be to travel. But I have to recognize, and I'll be really interested to hear you know, Gilbert's perspective on that, because that, that, in a way, could be quite a risk that we further, you know, that actually it doesn't, it, it works very well for uh, places with, with great internet connection. But then, um, so I, that, that, that's my view, though. I, I really think that this is going to come, and it's, it's, but if we can bring it sooner and yeah, pull more people in and, and, and tackle the environmental side with it, then I think it's even better. Yeah, I, I really liked what you said, Lily, um, because I, I know that um, we, we discussed this question before, so I put in some thoughts before, and I do think that the future is hybrid, but not in terms of, necessarily in terms of hybrid events, but more in terms of um, big conferences happening online, um, and small meetings, local meetings, local communities meeting in person. I think you already have said it. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, with the costs of travel and the restrictions and all that, a mix of both uh, virtual and online. So hybrids will be the future. I know we're excited to get back into in-person, but again, we realize we're actually doing much more online. So having that um, hybrid mix would kind of uh, get us uh, going and to be kind of the future of how we organize workshops and conferences. Thank you. Thank you all so much uh, for this conversation. It's really been such, uh, I've learned so much from you all and I hope the audience has as well. I hope you've uh, learned from each other. It's been really, um, really, really great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I guess a quick plug, if you are interested in co-sponsoring uh, another fireside chat, if you're interested in um, getting involved, please write in the pad, please get in touch, um, let us know. Uh, thanks again to uh, to Yanni, to Elio, to Lily, to Metadocentia and Frictionless Data for co-sponsoring this event. Um, and really thanks for let, so much for lending your experience and your expertise. Um, actually, so we are going to close this session with a suggestion that Gilbert had given when we were in planning, which was that I will leave the Zoom room open for the next 30 minutes for anyone that wants to stick around, uh, that wants to have an informal chat, um, wants to ask questions, there is no pressure for either anyone attending or for uh, any of the speakers to stay, uh, but it's just something that's available if you'd like to tune in with a smaller audience or have a question you'd like to ask. So thanks so much to everyone and um, have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>